Good morning, brethren. I want to speak this morning about the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's in Exodus 20, verse 12. Now this is a, a subject that touches the heart of many different people in many different backgrounds, many different lifestyles that they come from. And honoring one's father and mother means to respect them, to honor them when they're old, to take care or help take care of them. To follow their directions when we are young. Of course, I'm talking about proper, correct directions given from the biblical prescription. I mean, from the biblical uh, perspective. And from the book of Proverbs, it's 31 chapters. And there's other scriptures in the God's Word, the truth, in the book of Ecclesiastes, and in the New Testament, and in the New Covenant, there are scriptures. Now, I know that honoring one's father and mother is a commandment. But this dilemma weighs heavy on the hearts of many children of abusive parents and abusers and their silent partners never miss an opportunity to remind us that as Christians we have to honor our fathers and mothers apparently and according to their thinking no matter what no matter how your parents treat you certainly none of us won't to break one of the Ten Commandments. But the idea of rewarding abusers with honor seems completely irrational, in my opinion, and contradictory uh, to just about everything else written in the Bible, where evildoers are never honored, but punished time and again. This is God's law of sowing and reaping. Uh, that's in Galatians 6, verse 7, and Job 4, 8. I'm going to be sharing some scriptures with, with you regarding the subject. That those who do wrong will not benefit from their wickedness, but suffer the national, I mean the natural consequences of their actions. Now, the first question I'm going to ask, rhetorical question, is... What does it mean to honor someone? Let's explore that for a few here. Our abusive parents would have us think it means letting them get away with murder. But we have already refuted this in numerous other articles. In uh, Church of God News group, in the file section the topic section of files are uploaded there are many files that you can download and study this is God's law as I said a while ago of sowing and reaping now then our abusive parents as I stated would have us think it means lay the middle of murder uh, do they want us to believe that we have to obey them unquestionably, even though we are now adults, and even what they want is evil. But that's the question. And I think we each need to define what honoring means to us and find a definition we are comfortable with. To some, it might mean limited contact, an occasional car, 
or a brief visit. To others, it might mean not calling the police and having your parents arrested for child abuse, molestation, stealing from you, using your social security number to take out credit cards and ruining your credit, stalking you, or any of the dozens of other prosecutable crimes committed against many of us. Thank goodness my parents never did that to me. And to still others, it might mean letting your abusers live their lives in peace and be who they are while you live yours in peace on the other side of town or on the other side of the country. Like I've heard people say in the past, and even in my family, my relatives say, you stay in your background and I'll stay in my backyard. In other words, you stay over there where you're at, you stay on your side of town, and don't come over here on my side at all. You stay in your yard, I'll stay in mine. But one thing honoring does not mean is that you have no choice but to tolerate their abuse, because we do have choices. God created human beings not to be robots, but he created them to make a choice. He created them to be able to make choices to do good or do evil. One thing honoring does not mean is that you have, you have no choice but to tolerate their abuse. Honoring does not mean that you never confront or set limits on someone's behavior. Honoring does not mean you have to give up all hope of ever being treated nicely and sacrifice your own health and well-being for an abuser's sadistic enjoyment. Even if you must divorce your parents and never see them again, it doesn't mean that you're dishonoring them. It just means that you accept that they are the way they are and that they'll never change. Which in truth is honoring them as people whose right it is to be everything they want to be, that you're okay with it. And even that you're still that you still feel love for them, but you just can't stick around for it anymore. You're tired of the abuse, the verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse. Given the unfortunate reality of their innate hatefulness, you can still choose to set limits on them or have no contact with them because they are destructive people. That's with anybody, even with parents. You can honor them by accepting them for who they are, not expecting change, and letting them live their own way in peace. <clears throat> you don't have to go out of your way in spite to cause problems for them. Uh, in other words, just let them waller in their own mire, so to speak. But at the same time, honor yourself and your own right to live in peace as well, which means choosing not to be in their presence when they are abusing you. You know, there's different types of abuses as children or as grown adults, though so mostly the abuse comes in verbal abuse. When you're children, it comes in several different forms. Because when you're grown up, unless you're physically able not not able to defend yourself, uh, physical and sexual abuse you can usually defend from. But as a child, I understand. You know, a small child being physically, sexually abused and verbally abused. Another question. Why does it seem like the Bible is telling us to honor abusers? Well, we asked that question a while ago. 
in the, in the synopsis at the beginning. Well, first of all, the words father and mother, as referred to when the Lord commands us to honor, mean people who took care of us, nurtured us, protected us, loved us, and still love us. Unfortunately, not all of us have had such people in our lives. They do not mean sperm donor and egg donor. It takes far more than that to qualify as a father or a mother by biblical standards. The Bible gives us many examples of the kinds of parents God is referring to when he uses the words father or mother. <clears throat> Excuse me. God is not telling us to honor abusers who don't deserve to be honored. It helps to remind ourselves that God does not do non cynical, I mean nonsensical, irrational, or contradictory things. He never rewards evil, and he never says anything to us that would make it easier for evil to thrive or for abusers to get away with their cruelty. It doesn't make sense that our God, who is all God, all, who is all good, would tell us to encourage and reward evil. If it doesn't make sense and we do not feel at peace in our spirit about it, then it is not from God. So, brethren, we need to dwell a little deeper into his word and pray for a better understanding. You know, the Bible is written for a broad population of God's children. And some individuals within that population uh, have unique situations to which broad teachings cannot necessarily be applied. Not everything in the Bible is written for a particular circumstance. Much of what is written refers to general situations rather than specific situations. For instance, although we are instructed to treat those who preach and teach with double honor, that's in 1 Timothy 5, 17, Jesus holds nothing back when sternly and publicly rebuking the Pharisees who preached and taught. They were not deserving of respect and honor. And Jesus didn't give it to them. Instead, he spoke the truth about them. Took a stand against them and openly disapproved of their hypocrisy and their wickedness. He warned the people about them, teaching them to be on guard against their teachings and not to believe them. He publicly rebuked them. He compared them to whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full of dead man's bones on the inside, and everything unclean. He point blank accused them of being hypocrites, obstructionists, phonies, full of false pride, and even called them snakes, a brood of vipers and sons of hell. And you can find that, brethren, in Matthew 16, 11 through 12, Matthew 23, 1 through 36, Luke 11, 37 through 12, 3, and Luke 18, 9 through 14. In Matthew 23, Jesus speaks to the crowd about honoring the Pharisees. He says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Everything they do is done for men to see. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi, which means teacher. 
But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, as the Catholics do with priests. For you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's Matthew 23, 2 through 3, Matthew 5, 6 through 12. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see that Jesus specifically instructs the people not to give any special honor to the Pharisees because they are not deserving of it. And another example of a general teaching is illustrated in the Romans 13, 1 through 2. It says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who, who rebels or who rebels against the authority is a rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. How do they do that? Well, they can be arrested, they can be fined, they can be jailed. Uh, in Titus 3 1, we are again told to submit to our rulers and authorities, unless those authorities require us. To apostatize, proselytize, and go against the commandments and the words of God in Jesus Christ. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. However, in a well known specific instance of rebellion against one individual authority, the three wise men defied Herod's instructions to return to him after finding the Christ child and to tell him what the baby was. But instead, they returned to the country by another route. You can find that in Matthew 2, chapter 7 through 12. The Magi did not submit to Herod's authority because he was an unjust, unrighteous, evil ruler. Instead, they did what God wanted them to do and protected the baby Jesus. So although we are told to obey our rulers and authorities, the exception to this teaching is that it does not apply to rulers and authorities who are evil. i put that in parentheses. Similarly, what is written in the Bible about family relationships between parents and children, husbands and wives, and other family members are God's instructions for family life in general. But specific circumstances, I'm sorry, but specific circumstances would call for a different and perhaps even totally opposite response from us. The Bible is written for godly people and godly families. It is the Lord's instructions for godly marriage and a godly family life. It is how God wants his children to behave toward excuse me, one another, to, to be able to live together in peace and harmony and show the love of God to each other through his grace. And brethren, it simply does not apply to abusive families, and they are, they're certainly not obeying it. Let me try that again. It simply doesn't apply to abusive families, and it can't apply to abusive families. 
The abusers in our families aren't reading it anyway, and if they are, they're certainly not obeying it. You cannot treat an evil person the same way you can treat a godly, righteous person and expect a peaceful, joyful, godly family family to result. Light and darkness have nothing in common, my friend. God's instructions to his children on how to treat one another were never written to benefit abusers. The Bible was not written for the children of Satan to twist to suit their own purpose. And it's up to the children of God to not allow this. Just as we are not to give honor to hypocritical evil teachers and preachers and ministers and elders and fellow brethren, and just as we are not to obey and submit to evil rulers and authorities, neither are we to honor evil and abusive parents who are not deserving of honor. I was a victim of physical abuse and a lot of verbal abuse as a child, as a teenager, even as a grown-up person. I forgave the person, even took care of the person up until shortly before their death. That was a hard thing to do. And although we are told to submit to governing authorities, the scriptures contain numerous references to confronting, disobeying, fighting against, and even overthrowing ungodly, unjust, or wicked authorities. One of the most interesting accounts of a child defying his father starts in 1 Samuel, where we begin to read the story of David, who slew Goliath and became a faithful servant of King Saul. Saul's son Jonathan loved David as if he was his own brother. You'll find that in 1 Samuel 18, 1-4. Saul became jealous of David's Uh, heroic exploits and popularity with the people and began trying to kill him. He pursued him. 1 Samuel 18, uh, 1, 15, 25, and 29. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel 18 and uh, 1 Samuel 1, 15, 1 Samuel 25 and 29. And 1 Samuel 19, etc. Saul continued to persecute David and continued trying to kill him, even though David had always been loyal to Saul and even spared Saul's life when he had the opportunity to kill him. 1 Samuel 24. That's when Daniel, I mean, when uh, David hid in the cave and it was behind Samuel. He could have killed Samuel with the spear then. But he didn't. He had mercy on him. He showed grace. The books of 1 and 2 Samuel chronicles the many years of that saga. Many of the Psalms written by David tell of his anguish over Saul's persecution as he pleaded with the Lord to help him with those feelings of rejection, feelings of being pursued. Feelings of hatred from Saul. Feelings of not being loved by Saul when he should have been. And what is interesting about this what is interesting about this story is the account of Saul's son, Jonathan. As told in 1 Samuel 20, Jonathan protected David, helped him to hide, and tried to act as a go between between him and Saul and to make peace. What happened next was an eye-opener for Jonathan about the extent of his father's wickedness. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan. He said to him, 
you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame, to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. But God, you know, had already said David was going to be the new king. And he says, why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father that. But Paul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. <clears throat> Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger on that second day of the month. He did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. That's First Samuel 20. 30 through 34. Jonathan was ashamed of his father's behavior. When Jonathan believed that his father was being just, he confronted him. When Jonathan realized that his father intended to kill David, he defiled him. The next day, he warned David and protected him by allowing him to escape to Nob. At great personal cost to himself and the loss of his kingdom, Jonathan stepped in and stopped his father from doing wrong and hurting an innocent person. He did not show honor to his father. He showed fierce anger instead. Jonathan did not obey his father. Instead, he did the right thing and thwarted his father's plans. Now, Jonathan did not think in terms of he's my father, right or wrong. And I have to honor him and do whatever he wants me to do, right or wrong. In fact, when given the choice between doing what was right and obeying his abusive father, he betrayed his father. Jonathan publicly disagreed with his father, expressed fierce anger to his father, <clears throat> and then went behind his father's back to do the right thing and save David. And thanks to him, David went on to become king and a cornerstone of the history of our faith. Jonathan is a biblical hero not for honoring his father, but for standing up to his father and taking action against him because what his father was doing was wrong and Jonathan would not allow it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jonathan's story illustrates, brethren, that honoring as referred to in scriptures does not mean letting our abusive parents getting away with anything they want, no matter how awful without ever stopping them, or at least making them live with the consequences of their own actions. If your parents were abusing your child, would you not stop them and protect your child for fear that you were abusing your child? Let's try that again. I misstated. If your parents were abusing your child, brother, would you not stop them and protect your child for fear that you would be dishonoring your parents? Then why would stopping them from then why would stopping them from abusing you and protecting yourself be any different? If you're not dishonoring your parents by protecting someone else from them, then you're not dishonoring them by protecting yourself either. Brethren, let the truth speak for itself. Telling the truth is not dishonoring someone. <coughs> Excuse me. I have always believed that if you don't want anyone to know what you did, then just don't do it. If an abuser is so sure that he's right 
question, or she's right, and that her or his behavior is justified, then they should have no problem telling everyone or having you tell everyone what he what they did and still holding their head up high. They should want you to tell the truth about themselves to everyone you meet since we're going to make them look good. But if he or she a shame for others to hear about the things they've said and done, then maybe they need to reassess how they act towards you. If you hide what someone does or cover up the truth, that would be dishonoring him because it would mean that you were ashamed of him or her or embarrassed by them. An abuser has no right to become angry when you rebuke him or her or to accuse you of dishonoring him or her. If you are speaking the truth, he or she is the one who did what they did. You only told the truth about it, brother. One of the best ways to honor someone is to help them be the very best person they can be. <clears throat> Some people need a little push along the path to righteousness and godliness. Allowing God's law of sowing and reaping to bring evil people to repentance is more beneficial to them than interfering with the natural consequences of their behavior by, by giving them a free ride. The Bible tells us to rebuke evil and try to turn sinners from their wicked ways in the hopes of saving them. Ezekiel 33, 7-9 talks about that. This is the biggest favor and honor we could do for them, brethren. However, the Bible also tells us not to do this repeatedly, but no more than once or twice. You'll find that in Titus 3, 10 through 11, and Matthew chapter 10, 13 through 16, Proverbs 23, verse 9, etc. We are to walk away and leave them to God's natural consequences. We have treated them in an honorable manner, honored them, and now our obligation is over. Many of us still love our abusers, but because it is not safe to be with them, we have learned to love them from a distance. I, both my parents are, are dead or passed away, but <clears throat> I still love people who have abusive mouths. I love them from a distance. <laughs> the same is true of honoring. If your parents refuse to respect your boundaries and choose to continue mistreating you, then you can limit or end, if necessary, <clears throat> your time with them. Honor them from a safe distance and still be obedient to God's word. Only people who won't carte blanche to get away with anything would accuse you of not honoring them simply because you spoke the truth and set healthy boundaries in your relationship. Brethren, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not put out evil against your neighbor and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this declares the Lord. Zechariah 8, 16 through 17. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 6. But we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. 
2 Corinthians 13 and 8. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheme ways. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. So, brethren, I hope this little message gave you some insight on honoring abusive parents. And thank you for listening. Bye-bye.